make sure you do that. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're in part three of our message series entitled The L Word for Love. And we're going through 1 Corinthians 13. We did it the last uh, two weeks, and we're going to cover it today. And I'm going to be finishing up this message series next week. Next week. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to be, be reading from verses 4 through 7. If you silently read along with me, let me read out loud God's holy word. Love is patient. In other words, as we learned last week, love is long-suffering with people. Love is kind. It's not just being nice. It actually means a gentle sweetness that's shown to everyone. It does not envy. It is not coveting or jealous. It does not boast. It does not try to jump and hurdle other people. It is not proud. It is not insisting upon its own self-importance. Now, starting today, we're going to cover this today. It does not dishonor others. Everybody say dishonor. Okay. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, as we're talking about what the Bible says about love, help us remember that when the Bible talks about love, it's talking about you. And that, Lord, it talks about what you've done for us. And I pray that you'll do just a fresh revelation of what your love is. Your love cannot be denied. The grave cannot hold you back. Death cannot hold you back. The devil himself cannot hold you back. But your love raised you up out of that grave, Lord God. And those who believe in you, you raised us up as well with you, Lord. And for that, we are so thankful indeed. Lord, have your way. Speak through me. And speak to your people, Lord God. And may every one of them be loved by the word of God today. We give you all the glory in the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Everyone said? Amen. I know it was a little cloudy. I said you get affected by seasonal affect disorder, but if you're glad to be in the house of God, can I get a loud amen? All right, amen. amen. You know, last week I mentioned about a, a really good book that I encourage you to read, uh, The Three Hardest Words by Leonard Sweet. And I mentioned to you, just as a quick recap, that he says the three hardest words are I love you. Because saying it is easy, but to living it out is such a difficult thing indeed. And can I be completely honest with you? All of us right now is an amalgam accumulation of how we receive love or not. Think about it. Through your family, through parents, through relationships, through friendships, through what people did to you at work, at school, your teacher and all that. We are in many ways so shaped by love or the misinterpretations of love, what people didn't do properly as a result of that. And so that's why it's so important that we need to understand God's love, God's way, not man's way. Can I get an amen, all right? And so the three hardest words, according to Leonard Sweet, is I love you. But he also want to, uh, I want to go a little further than that because, because based upon our need for love and significance, and we didn't get it the way that God originally intended because of the sinfulness of man, because of that, we're trying to strive and live life. And we don't want to have any regrets, but as I mentioned, the three key words that people, when they're about to die and live their last breath here on earth, the three words they want to hear from their loved ones is, I love you. And I don't want any of us to have any regrets in life. And I don't think any of us want to have any regrets in life. Whether we think we're going to live 20 years or maybe God might call our time a little sooner than that. We don't want to, have, want to have any regrets. But he also says this. Uh, Leonard Tweet says this. He says this, that most of us live through what he calls dinosaurian living. Can you point to someone next to you and say, don't live like a dinosaur? Point to someone next to you and say, don't live like a dinosaur. For you newcomers, you're wondering, why is this guy asking? Well, we'd like to have a very interactive church. And, and you're saying, dinosaurs are extinct. You, know, you can only see that when you go to a museum and all, and all that way. But he says it this way. He says, we rush through life never really living on this planet except as dinosaurs as they lived on it. A dinosaurian philosophy of life is a basic brain response to everyday existence. And he says the dinosaurs lived on four purposes that we, because of our need for love and significance or because we not received the love that we should have gotten, we're actually broken people, we're striving after these four same things. Dinosaurian philosophy of life. Number one, to feed. Number two, to fight for your life. Number three, 
to protect yourself. And number four, to pleasure yourself as often as possible. Think about that. Isn't that so true? We actually live our lives according to that. To feed, feeding to live, fighting to live, fleeing and protecting yourself to live, and sex to enjoy and to reproduce and continue gene flow for pleasure and for prominence as a result of that. And I want to say this, the devil is so good that because of that, we want to play it safe in life. And we want to fill the love cup that God has wired and created in us that only the way that he has created us to be filled in that way. But because we don't get it, we're trying to live a certain life a certain way. And I put it this way. You see the birds outside, they're chirping and they're living freely. But have you ever been inside an airport terminal, a large one, and you saw the birds that are living inside the airport terminal? Right? You've seen them. Because you're afraid that when they get on you, they might actually drop something, some blessing upon you. You're afraid of that. They're living inside an airport terminal. And they're having bounty because the food and the crumbs you leave behind, it gets to enjoy it. There's no predators. And so it's enjoying it. And it's flying inside an airport terminal. But is it really free? The question to that is no. In many ways for us, it's analogous to us in life that we're trying to live life and we're trying to keep it safe, protect ourselves, secure. We're trying to make it in life, but we are called to be living outside, but we're trying to play comfortable in that way. But the Bible is so clear. He tells us the most excellent way to, above, to rise above the stuff that keeps us down the pains and the struggles and all the storms of life that beat us down and make us never to aspire further. I love what that uh, offering song sang by uh, the worship team, especially by, did you realize something that was so well? Trust in him because the waves and the winds know the name of Jesus. Do you get it? That even the storms, the winds that are coming at you, the hardships, the, the waves, they all know the name of Jesus. Can I get a hallelujah to that? So that means whatever you're facing will bend to the name of Jesus Christ. Because everything God created, everything, the winds and the waves and the storms, nothing just happens but it's created under God's will. And God says, I want you to come to the proper understanding and order of how you can live life the most excellent way. And that is not to love the things of this world, but to love according to God's biblical way, to live is to love, and that's how you really live, to love God's way. I want to share with you the final parts of verses 4 through 7 about the characteristics of how God has called us to live. Today, I want to quickly go through this. The thing that we talked about is, uh, the first thing that we read here is the fact that in verse 5, it does not dishonor others. Can you point to someone next to say, I'm not going to dishonor you? Point to someone next to you and say, I'm not going to dishonor you. Now, if we're honest, sooner or later, we will dishonor one another, all right? We may say in our words, but we will dishonor. A husband will say that to his wife right now. A couple of days later, they may not do so. A child might say that to their parent, but a couple of days later, or maybe tonight, they will not do so. But the Bible says it does not dishonor others. But the original reading goes a little deeper. It simply means it is not rude. My son was singing a song, and this is how old I am. I'm in my 40s, okay? I'll just say that. And uh, I used to be in the... I used to, when I was young, fresh out of seminary... I would, not because I, I would intentionally watch MTV and VH1, so I would be hip knowing what people are listening to. But as I've gotten older, all I listen to is praise songs these days. And so my, song, my son was like, why you have to be so cruel or rude, or whatever it is, whatever that song, don't you know I'm human? So I'm like, who in the world sings that? And my, uh, my son was saying that, and then, uh, he would just say that to me, like, why do you have to be so rude? And I'm like, why are you being rude to me right now? And it simply means love is not rude or does not act in an unbecoming manner. It has more in the sense that agape love, the love of God, does not behave gracelessly. It is not being blunt or brutal, but rather a sense of courtesy, tact, and politeness. Let's be honest. We need more politeness and kindness in our world today. Can I get an amen, right? Some people get mad at a church parking lot. Somebody took my favorite space today. 
Somebody actually took my seat where I'm actually supposed to be seated at church today. And we're not so kind. We tend to be rude. You go to the mall, someone's rude. You're about to go over that cross rock and the person doesn't slow down for you. And you get so angry as a result of that. When you're actually seeing someone and you could actually let that person pass through and you're about to, but the person doesn't even think you're there and just walks on by and you get really upset by that. People are so rude today, aren't they not? But I want to just challenge you, if we bring back a little bit of what the, God, but the word of the God says, that we're not supposed to be showing dishonor, because the way that God actually wants us, we value every person, not for what they could do for me, not for any benefit, but we value them the way that God values them. Can I get an amen? So that's why we have a biblical culture of honor. We value you, not based on how you look, not based on what brand you wear, not based on what car you drove into the parking lot. Not based on how many degrees or what the name of your school that you graduated is, is actually on your resume. Not based upon what, if I'm friend to you, what can I benefit from you? We value you because God simply says, he is my child, she is my daughter, and so we value in the same way. And that's what it means to not dishonor, we value people in that way. But not only that, it also means because if we value them, we're not going to treat them in a rude and cruel way. And you know, I want to just be completely honest with you. It's time to hold on to the wisdom of God that transcends all generations. Because what's always hip, What's always actually for the younger generation, they sometimes want to throw out, oh, that's old, passe, but there's some things that need to be reclaimed. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's still wise. Doesn't mean it's not necessary. They're actually wise and timeless in that way. You know, for instance, um, I, I'm thankful to the Lord. I have two kids. One is a teenager and one's about to become a teenager and all that. And, and they're trying to teach me a lot of vernacular stuff. And, and I want to just ask that we reclaim and teach them what proper respect and honor is in the truest sense. We need to get that back. Because, you know, uh, I, I mentioned this earlier. My son came to me one time and said, Dad, that is so rad. I'm like, what is that? That is rad. That means it's awesome. It's cool. And so I, I researched where they get that word. I, I never heard it. I did pretty well on my SAT ver a verbal. And I'm like, I never heard of that rad other than the dictionary term rad is a physics term for a dosage of radiation that you get. <laughs> so every time you say rad, you're saying radiation, radiation, doses of radiation. But I researched and I found out that that word came from a movie or cartoon, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You mean to tell me that you're going to let some comic book mutant turtle change the English language? Such a way that rad is now something awesome? No, I'm going to call it, it's called radiation. That's what the proper English is all about, and that's what I'm going to keep it in that way. And now today we have kids showing that they're so cool. They say the word, they tilt their head up, sup. Sup. I've had kids come up to me. I am my, even my own son. Well, I'm working on my desk. Sup, dad. And I'm used to saying, how are you? What's up? And you know, I thought about it this way. And you know, they can say it amongst their friends and all that. But we need to properly respect and, and not, and it's not because I'm insecure. I need my son to treat me. No, it's because we need to hold on to some proper principles. Can you imagine if my son went to his grandmother who was 75 years of age? What's up, grandma? I don't think she'll know what she, he's trying to say, right? Or can you imagine if our young kids had 96-year-old Reverend Billy Graham, the great evangelist, here in our church service, and all our kids, we're all saying to the grown-ups, hi, how are you? Such an honor to meet you. My son goes up. What's up? <laughs> it's so disrespectful. And think about this. When kids say that to one another, what's the proper response? Nothing. Or... They say back, what's up? It's like a rhetorical question, what's up? What's up? <laughs> Next person, what's up? And it's such a rude thing in that way. I'm thinking, you say that to a grown-up, I'd be like, you say, how are you doing today, madame or mademoiselle? 
And it's probably important for us to treat people with proper respect because when we do so and not have a manner that's unbecoming but really valuing the person and treating the person to the level that God has created them, then indeed people will feel truly valued and loved by the love of Jesus Christ. That's what it means first to not dishonor people, not by being rude or to act in an unbecoming manner. If you track with me, can I get an amen, all right? Secondly, I want to quickly share with you that love is not self-seeking. Everybody say self-seeking, all right? The original meaning actually means it's not insisting upon my rights. Have you ever had someone come and say, I have my rights? Whether in work or in the courtroom or in your family, I have my rights. Husbands may say that, spouses may say that, children may I have my rights. But it's not insisting upon its rights, but rather it's incarnational self-giving, self-giving love. God's agape love does not insist on its own rights and privileges, but rather focuses upon your responsibilities and duties in that way. I love what one uh, uh, scholar said this. In the fi final analysis, there are in this world two kinds of people. Those who insist upon their privileges and those who always remember their responsibilities. Those who are thinking of what life owes me, and those who never forget what they owe life. He says it would be the key to almost all the problems which surround us today if men would think less of their rights and more of their duties. If we focus upon what God has called us to do, instead of demanding upon our rights in front of other people, I really do believe that God would not fill the area and the voids in our lives and fill those around us in every way. It is a matter of self-giving. That's what Jesus did. He didn't seek his own glory. Instead, he didn't just give something that was valuable to him. True agape love is giving not just something that's valuable, it's yourself to that person. That's why God says, this is how much I love you. Oh, this is so precious to me. I could give it. And why don't you take it? But rather, it is giving of himself what was most valuable and precious himself to each and every one of us. I don't know if you ever heard the story that a man had a, a vision or dream. And he, in this, he saw a homeless person. And his heart was moved. And he saw the homeless person and he was needing clothing. And he was so convicted, he decided, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless this person. And you know what he decided to do? He had a jacket on, and so what he decided to do was he took off his jacket, but amazingly, he didn't give the full jacket because he was cold himself. So he cut the jacket in half, and he gave it to the homeless person. So the homeless person was half clothed, and he, the person put the other half of his clothing on, and then he went on his way. And in the dream... He saw the angels talking with Jesus. And they were mesmerized to see Jesus. And they said, Jesus, why are you like this? Said, what do you mean? Jesus, I see that you have a half of a jacket on you. Why is that? Well, it's because my child, my believer right there, gave half of his jacket to clothe that homeless person. And the Bible says, when you have done that unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. And so he's wearing that. And so I want to remind everyone that when we give the full of ourselves, that's when we're doing it unto Jesus Christ himself. Can I get an amen? Let me try to, try to drive this point even further. My wife and I, uh, when we do go out and eat, uh, I am one of those wired that when I find a dish that I love at a restaurant, I stick to it. I do not deviate from it. I thank you, God, for letting me find this great dish at this restaurant. I will not deviate from your word, therefore, and I will stick to it time and time again. Well, my wife, she's an adventurous person. She likes to try different dishes. And more often than not, she's like, you know what? I know the dish you're ordering, Steve, is so good, but I'm going to try something else. So you order something else. And most times, her dish, she doesn't end up liking. And I see her, she's like, not as good as I thought. And I see her eyeing my dish. <laughs> and can I just give a word of, of, of truth to the women? God has wired men to not share their food. <laughs> men consider it a badge of honor to finish what is set before them, all right? It is a major accomplishment. So we do not like to share our food. 
But I see my wife, she's not eating fast because she doesn't like her food. And then I'm stuck with a major dilemma. What shall I do? So I say, honey, um, you want my dish? She's like, oh, no, it's okay. But I could tell. She's like, yes, yes, that's right. Like, oh, okay, why don't we switch dishes? So we switch. And she gets to enjoy her dish. And I'm tasting. I'm like, in my mind, you're right. It doesn't taste as good as my dish. But I know this. The minute that I'm eating her dish and she's eating mine, all of heaven is applauding, saying, good job, Steve. Now that's self-giving love. And so you know what love is? Love, when you show it, is never cheap. It has to cost us something. Because if it's cheap, it's not significant to you. And so love is not self-seeking. We're insisting, I'm right and you're wrong. But it's incarnational, self-giving. Can you point to someone next to you and say, let's be more self-giving to each other. Let's be more self-giving to each other. And all you husbands, you know, today or tomorrow when you go to a restaurant, and your wife doesn't like the dish, do the right thing, all right, all right, just all right. You know, that's why it says here in uh, John chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, put it on the screen here, Jesus modeled it. And if you see in verse 1, it says, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knows that he's about to be crucified. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, his disciples, he loved them to the end. The original actual translation can actually mean this. He showed them the full full extent of his love. And how did he do this? So he got up from the meal, took off his outer garment, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And it so convicts me, and it shows should convict everyone that's serving, that what we're supposed to do is self-giving love in many ways, is we're supposed to be able to say, I'm supposed to be giving. I'm supposed to be lowering myself to pick you up. Like Jesus washed his feet. He gave himself. I am the king of glory, Jesus says. And yet he took himself the form of the lowest servant. There are different levels of servants. He took himself the form of the lowest servant. The lowest servant had the unenviable task of washing people's feet. And he did that. And he gave himself to us. And that's how we're supposed to be doing it. Literally, when we're serving at church in the body of Christ, we are supposed to be washing the feet of one another by giving each other and serving each other in that way. That's what it truly means. The third point I want to quickly share with you, not only about self-giving, is that love is not easily angered. Everybody say, not angered, okay? Can you point someone else to say, don't make me mad, all right? Point someone else to say, don't make me mad, okay? And can, I, can we be honest? How come we're so patient with people, anyone outside of our family. But when it comes to our own family, we fail at that all the time, don't we? Love is not easily angered. The original meaning, actually, is, is not easily provoked. And get this, in the original nuance, it means not easily provoked by offense personally done to you. Now, I want to distinguish between what's righteous indignation and self-righteous indignation. Let me be clear. The Bible rules out Getting angry when someone does you wrong. Someone lies about you. Someone slanders you. Someone meets, treats you at work. Someone does un something unethical, not fair to you. Someone does something wrong personally against you, personal injury events. God says, do not get angry about that. That is righteous indignation. But we oftentimes get angry over self-righteousness. Something did this, someone did this to me, therefore I'm going to get upset about it. But God says, no. Don't get angry about what someone does against you. Get angry when someone else is being wrong. When someone else is being mistreated. When someone else is being unfairly taken advantage of. Get angry when God's holiness and character is being attacked. But when it comes to you, forgive. But when it comes to other people being mistreated, then you should get what's called righteous indignation. That's why Jesus actually did it himself. Jesus never got angry when the Pharisees beat him up, slapped him, and they spat on his face. He didn't say a single word, anything personally done against him. He didn't do anything when they nailed him to the cross and nailed his hands and his feet, and then they were jeering at him. Can you imagine the mockery? He had healed, 
and ministered to so many people, set them free. And the same crowd turned and said, he, could, he did it for so many people. He did miracles. Why can't he do it himself? And they mocked him and they jeered him. And yet he was silent like a sheep to the slaughter. Any personal injury, he did not take offense. But when did he get righteous indignation? When he entered the house of God and he saw that the leaders had made the church into a den of robbers, stealing, mistreating people, having religious services but not really having God there. That's when he got angry and righteous anger and he overturned the table of the money changers. That's what it means. Love is not easily angered. Not over personal offense, but when it's God is offended and other people are offended as well. That's why the Apostle Paul, he got angry and upset and wrote, stand for righteousness, stand for justice, stand for truth. But whenever somebody lied about him, whenever he was beaten, whenever he was put in jail, he did not get angry over personal slights to him. And you see, that's why we get angry about what people do to us. Can I be completely honest with you? When somebody else is wronged, we don't get so upset about it, do we? Let's be honest. Oh, somebody, there was a drive-by shooting in L.A. Oh, it's down in L.A. I live in Orange County. Thank God. But that person was somebody's child. And that person was a child of God. But we get so offended. And we're not able to let go of it. And then we let the anger turn into sin. The Bible says, do not let your anger lead you into sin. And something for all of us, especially that some people here may have anger problems. They have an easy flare-up. And another interpretation of this word is anger that just flares up and explodes. And can I be honest with you? I love what one scholar said this. He said, he who masters anger is master over everything. And I want to encourage all of you that when you subject yourself to God, God can cover and be able to do things that you can't do. And he can allow you to get angry and upset over things that upsets the heart of God to show a lot of grace. I don't know if many of you know this or not, but Billy Graham himself admits that he, has a, he had a real anger problem. But he constantly went before the Lord, and God was able to cover him. And you see his ministry, you never hear of any instance of him losing it. But the truth of the matter is, he does that. His wife said, yeah, Billy had a big anger problem. But he was able to temper that by submitting it over to the Lord. Like I said, this agape love is a fruit of the Holy Spirit in that way. And I know some of you like to lessen it. Pastor, you don't understand, I get angry a lot, but it's so short. It only lasts for a few seconds. But let me also say this, as one person said, so is a nuclear bomb. It only lasts for a few seconds. But the damage that it causes is so long-lasting. And that's why I want to challenge all of us. Let's get upset over things that upset the heart of God. Instead of personal offense, turn the other way as Jesus did it. Can I get an amen? But let's get upset over the fact that there's some people here today they don't know the love of Jesus Christ. And they've been abused and they've gotten wrong type of love. And I get upset because I want the love of Christ to set them free. I get upset when people are actually sexually abused, human sex trafficking. I get upset over the fact that if your child is lost and they're not found within 72 hours, the chance of them that they've been kidnapped for sex trafficking is huge. I get upset over that. I get over the, upset over the fact that we need to help the homeless and the poor more. And we need to be able to feed them because Jesus, when you do this, you're doing it unto me. So we do, we should get upset over the things that upset the heart of God. But when it comes to somebody attacking me, saying bad things about me, cutting me off, taking my parking space, doing whatever, turn the other way, turn the cheek, and let's let the love of God conquer that in every which way. You love that way, and you only stand up for the injustice upon other people, and you let God take care of your justice, you will see God will never fail. Love never fails as a result of that. So that's what it means to overlook and not be easily provoked. Point to the same person that just said and said, I won't be easily provoked by you. Point to the same person and say, I will not be easily provoked by you. James 1, 19 to 20, put it up there, it actually says this, my dear brothers, 
take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Can I get an amen to that? All right. Number four, another characteristic that we see here, love keeps no record of wrongs. Everybody say no record, okay? And the original meaning for that is it forgives and forever forgets. It forgives and forever forgets. More, no permanent ledger bookkeeping. That's what the original meaning has. One person said it this way, love does not store up the memory of any wrong it has received. The original word is an accountant word. I don't know if there are any people here who has finance or accounting background. It means to take into account and to store up and record in a bookkeeping ledger book. The purpose of it is to keep a permanent record that can be consulted and referred to back at any given occasion. It's stored up so that it will not be forgotten. You know, at my age, I hear so many people coming and say to me, man, my memory isn't what it used to be. I forget my keys. I forget phone numbers. I forget people's names. Hello, all right? You know, I'm, I'm guilty of that too, you know? I'm just being totally, you know, I cannot. If, if I say, hello, brother, it's because I forgot your name. <laughs> Newcomer that comes, I meet them the following week. I'm like, hey, brother, how are you? <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, we, we have terrible memories, right? But why is it that when it comes to wrongs done against us, we all have photographic memories? Spouses, you remember when your husband did not open the door for you. 1997, October it was. At that shopping mall, South Coast Plaza, the entrance to Bloomingdale's. Yes, I remember it well. Just before the makeup area, you remember all those types of things. Remember it, and when you're arguing, your memory all of a sudden opens up, and you're throwing, I remember when your mother-in-law, or my mother-in-law said this and all this, and you're throwing all these things. But the Bible says, love keeps no record of wrongs. But can I be honest? We love to keep a record of wrongs because we use it for our own advantage. Right? Store it up. It's, it's my ace card. I could use it any time. Bring it up. You see? And the Bible says, no, that's not a God we love. You need to forgive and forever forget as a result of that. Why? It's because of the fact that that's what Christ Jesus has done. But this is so important. You know, I read that in one Polynesian culture, the men would, you know, eat together and they would fight. And this is part of their custom, of their culture. They would go to their home and it was their custom that they would write articles of wrongs that someone had done and they would attach it to the roof of their home. So that wherever they're going, they see these articles that are hanging. So whenever they come home, they see these articles. And to illustrate, I, I put some things here like this. You go home and you put, parents are hypocrites. And you put the date down, May 25th, 2010. They were hypocrites at church meeting. You hang it there and you use that against them. Another one. Wife disrespected me. June 25th, 2002, at a wedding reception. <laughs> Your friend, Chuck beat me up at school. December 17th, 2007. Apollos, I'm using Greek names because I don't want to if I use a certain name, you might think, well, pastor's picking on me, okay, that's what. Apollo slandered me, May 17th, 1972. And you put it all up there. And the culture, they would come home and they're happy. Oh, yeah, Apollo slandered me back in 1972. Huh? Oh, yeah, my wife disrespected me. That's right. And you know what? We think, oh, I would never do that. But we put these articles up in our minds every day. And we keep warming ourselves. We brood over that. We brood over that. Don't be acting like and looking at me like you never do this. We all hold on to these things. And it's because of the fact that somebody may do nine wonderful things, but one little mistake, you remember that one wrong. We like to hold on to these things. But God's love says it keeps no record of wrongs. 
That's why Jesus himself says, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. That's why Jesus forgives and he forgets. Romans 4, uh, we put up on there, uh, 7 through 8 says this, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. That same word, ledger, it's been wiped out. God will not record that. And that's the amazing thing I want to encourage each and every one of us. That when you ask God, that's why we have church on Sundays, that's why I ask you, if you made a mistake, get right before God. Because Jesus paid for it all. Can I get an amen, right? So why do you want to keep on living with that sin unaddressed? He paid for it all. But when you go to him, he will cleanse you of that in that way. And so God has already forgiven you, but you need to receive that. You need to acknowledge that. And that's why it's so important that when you come to him and you ask him, God, I messed up today. I'm not perfect. God says, I've forgiven you and I've forgotten about it. And so many of us have a guilt contra- uh, a complex that the next day, the next morning, the dead of a woman will come and say, remember what you did yesterday or last night? Remember this? And he rings down your joy. And even though you prayed to God for forgiveness the night before and you went before God and the devil makes you feel so guilty. That's because the devil wants you to believe his lie, but... You have to understand that in that morning, if you feel guilty and you go to God and say, God, I'm so sorry I committed that sin, Jesus will say, what sin? I don't know what you're talking about. Because God is true to his word. Can I get an amen, right? So whatever sin that you committed and you ask God for forgiveness, God forgives and completely forgets it. It's wiped away clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why. No matter what you've gone through, if you come before God and ask for forgiveness, His forgiveness is still fresh than ever. And His forgetfulness is so fresh, He doesn't even remember what you did in the past. And I know some of us have this revisionist history. But pastor, what about the fact that because I did this, I think God's promise for my life has been altered. It will not fully happen. And people throw at uh, things like, what about King David? He sinned and he had too much blood, so he wasn't able to build the temple of God. God made his son do that. What about Moses, pastor? Because he disobeyed God, he, instead of just tapping the rock, he got angry and he slammed the rock with the, with the staff and water gushed out and God said, because of that, you will not enter the promised land. And because of that, so many of us think, because I messed up, I asked God for forgiveness. Yes, I know he's forgiven me, but I don't think he's completely forgotten about it because now my life is the way it is. I'm not meeting God's promise. I'm not fulf- God's not fulfilling everything in my life. Well, that is a lie from the devil. Why? Because you have to understand and trust God works all things for the good. And even your mess-ups, he'll turn it into God's perfect goodness. And you have to understand this. Just because it doesn't happen the way that you expected doesn't mean it's not happening the way that God intended it. You see, I really do believe that God wanted Solomon to build a temple. But think about this. David was still considered the greatest king of Israel even though he didn't build a temple. Solomon was the wisest and the richest But David had the title of being the greatest king of Israel as a result. God's perfect plans still was fulfilled in his life. Moses did not enter the promise. He led them to the desert to the edge of the promised land. And Joshua took over. Why? It was God's will that a new generation goes in and takes the promised land. But think about this. As great of a, a general and a conqueror that Joshua was, the Bible says, since then there has never been a prophet like Moses whom the Lord spoke to and knew face to face. You see how God comes through and has a divine purpose for each and every one of us. Now I want to encourage all each and every one of us in this way, that God will forgive and forget all of our sins. And if you just get right with God, God can still make his promise and dream for your life happen because God never will fail in the lives of his children. God will surely do this. And that means we need to understand that when we ask God for forgiveness, he forgives and forgets, and he's saying, can you do this well? And I want to make it very practical. Some of you people here, you have a spirit of unforgiveness over someone that they did to you. You might have even forgiven them, 
verbally. You even prayed that prayer. But you haven't forgotten it. That article is still hanging in your head. And I feel the Lord is saying, really give it over to me. As the song goes, let it go. <laughs> Forgive and forget about it. Because if you're holding on to it, it's not holding that person back. It's holding you back. And God wants to set you free by his love. Can I get an amen, all right? And how do we have a right to say, I'm not going to forgive what that person did. I'm not going to forget it, God. When Jesus forgave every one of our sins and forgot it. Are we greater than God? I don't think so. Maybe you think you are, but I'm not. And so God says, forgive and forget. And if we're not willing to forget, it's because we have an issue of pride that we want to say that that person has wronged me and I'm better than that person. That person deserves lesser. And God says, no, forgive and forget just as I've done to you. Can you point to someone next to you and say, just let it go, just let it go, just let it go. Fifth and final point I want to just encourage all of you is the fact that love does not delight in evil. What that means by that is finds no pleasure in anything wrong but rejoices with God's truth. That's what it says in verse 6. Why doesn't, and if you think about this, why does it say this this way? Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Logically, when you say love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with good, that's the opposite of evil, isn't it? Or righteousness, that's the opposite of evil, isn't it? Why does it say rejoices with the truth? You know why? It's talking to God's truth. And God's truth means that it's based upon God's righteousness, not man's righteousness. Man's righteousness comes and goes. Today, lying is wrong. Tomorrow, lying is different perspectives of truth. Today, sexual immorality is wrong. Tomorrow, sexual liberation. We have freedom and permissiveness in that way. Today, this is ethically wrong. Tomorrow, it's situational, based upon my situation. Is when I do it, it's right. When someone else is doing it, it's wrong. You see how when it's based upon man's truth, it's wrong. But when we base it upon God's righteousness, God's truth, which is based on God's righteousness, then it truly overcomes in that way. And I want to close by saying this, dearly beloved. This is really the end times. I'm not saying this because preachers like say this. Revelation talks about that there will be great martyrs for the faith. People, even in, if you don't believe me, look it up in, in, in Revelation, that those who believe in Jesus, some of them will be beheaded in the name of Jesus Christ. In my heart, I don't know when you saw the video of the 21 Egyptians who were beheaded because they were Coptic Christians. They were Christians. And I look at our lives, living here in the U.S., in Orange County. And their faith is really, and their love for Jesus is fully being tested. And we get tested by, oh, it's raining outside. Christians are driven from their homes and they're living right now. I saw a video from the Samaritan's Purse that they're trying to provide refugee food. They're living in these makeshift tents and it's cold and it's muddy. And yet, so many Christians, oh, it's not an ideal time to go to church today. It's too far, too time consuming. And yet, these Christians, with the sword at their face if you renounce Jesus Christ and declare that Allah is Lord by these ISIS terrorists then you will be spared but all 21 of these men said no we believe in Jesus and I read one article that this one bishop from the Catholic Church said that if you see the video closely most of the men a good number of them, you see their lips moving and you could see that they spoke three last words. 
many of them were saying as they're about to be beheaded three words Lord Jesus Christ three hardest words I love you God says I love you with his words Lord Jesus Christ and I want to challenge all of us can we awaken from just struggling with mere small things in life and let's live for the sake of Jesus Christ who is worthy of it all who is worthy of my living for him and I'm living in a country where it's air conditioned nice lighting and I want to say Lord you love me and you died on the cross for me I want to live my life for you in every single moment I don't want to live for the pleasures of this life. I want to live for Jesus who loves my soul in every way. And can we be stirred by that to awaken from our stupor and be able to live all out for Jesus Christ? It is the end times and Jesus will come very, very soon. I don't know when. I'm not going to predict it. But I do know it's coming very soon because you see the signs of the times. And I want young people and old people, singles and married folks, let's get our act together and live all out for Jesus Christ alone. Time is too precious. Jesus is coming soon. And he's saying, I'm coming and I love everyone. I love you by dying on the cross for you. Now live your life for me. Stop being upset by how people loved you. I love you. My love is complete. So love me and love one another and live your life for me. I want to ask if we quickly show this video and for, you know, their youth here because faith will be tested one day. And I know my wife will hate it if I ever say anything like this. But if you love Jesus in this place, can I get an amen? I have to say, if somebody came and threatened my life, and I know it seems so far-fetched because I live in the U.S., will you renounce Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or else you'll lose your life? I could honestly look at every one of you in the eye and say, Jesus is more real than my life situation right now. And he loves me. And he died on the cross for me. He paid for all of my sins. When I saw the names of those 21 brothers, yeah, they have a different skin complexion, different ethnicity. And one of them says, worker from a town. Didn't even get the person's name. But you'll see those names, 21 names. I know that when they said, Lord Jesus Christ, their last words here on earth, were the first words that was heard when they entered into heaven. And I see so many Christians just go into church and that, trying to live a comfortable life. And don't get me wrong, God wants to bless their lives. But Jesus has called us on a mission for him. And we don't, we're not threatened with the taking of our lives. Can we live all out for Jesus in our generation today? Jesus loves us so seriously. Can we seriously live for him as a result of that? I'm